Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. We might have to steer our spotlight back to Donald Trump later in the program. There's an astonishing exchange in an interview he's given to the New York Times where he's asked how he would solve problems between the uh, Turkish president Erdogan and the Kurdish people who, of course, are uh, camped upon the border looking for an autonomous homeland. And, and yeah, he's got it. He's, he's solved it. He, he's asked how he's going to fix that. Do you know how he's going to fix it? Do you know how Donald Trump is going to fix the, the, the problems between the Kurds and the Turks? Yeah, meetings. He's going to arrange some meetings. He's going to go, because no one's ever thought of that before. The man's a genius. We will examine the peculiar genius of Donald Trump after 11, but we begin with the peculiar state of workers in Britain, and we ask, why does nobody care? That's actually the question that I'm most interested in. Why, why does nobody care? You know, and I know, and I don't, I don't want to uh, sort of dampen our powder for the Donald Trump conversation. The, the, the easiest things to get people to care about are immigration and Muslims at the moment. And, and you, it's not hard to understand why, is it? A massive majority of terrorist attacks upon these islands and indeed on, upon our allies are undertaken by people who claim that they're doing it for, for religious reasons and their religion is Islam. Similarly with immigration, you can sort of stir up huge amounts of, of fear and anger by suggesting that you're having your biscuits stolen by somebody who hasn't been here very long. So I, it's easy to get people to care about those threats to them. They're threats in the future. They're fear of future things going wrong. Why do you think in Britain, and maybe it's true everywhere, why do you think in Britain it's so hard to get people to care about the way their neighbours are actually being treated at work? I, I, actually really and truly today being treated. Not some fear of some uh, future assault upon their liberties, or indeed upon their person. A sort of fear of, of the unknown, as it were. Is that what xenophobia means? Anyway, why is that so easy? And yet, if I told you now that, that when we talked about Uber and Hermes, the courier company, on Monday, the number of emails I got from people begging me not to read out their names, and they're still coming in now, particularly for the courier company, actually, even more so than with Uber, describing circumstances that I, I'm ashamed to tell you I did not know existed in my country. I did not know this sort of thing was going on. And a lot of the time, perhaps, when we've just begun to reach for the alarm button on these exploitative working practices, we've pulled back slightly because of the clamour calling us, oh, I don't know, whatever it might be, sort of lefties or, or socialists or people that have never run a business. And you sort of think, well, yeah, actually, do you know, I've, I've never really run a workforce. I've, I've had staff under me and I have a tiny little business of my own. But no, I've, I, I don't know what it's like to have 10 people dependent upon me for their income. So maybe I am missing something here. Maybe, maybe when they say, you know, oh, you can't, you can't have too many rights in the workplace, otherwise, otherwise people won't open businesses. You sort of think, oh, well, I can see some sort of logic in that. Oh, look at France. You've got loads of employment rights in France, so no one's employed. You go, yeah, I can see maybe there's, some, there's something in that. But when you dig down to the bottom of this story, you see things like... <laughs> you see things like this. A, a, a truly unbelievable sentence to come out of our parliament, out, out of our House of Commons. This is the Ian Wright, who was in the studio not long ago, wasn't he? The Select Committee... Chairman, um, Business Innovation and Skills Select Committee. This is the report that they published, and this is a direct quote from it. Success is founded on a business model that enables the majority of workers in both the warehouse at Shirebrook and the shops around the UK to be treated without dignity or respect. Goes worse. Talks about workers who are viewed, and I quote, as commodities rather than as human beings with rights, responsibilities and aspirations. If I say sorry to you for something, do you promise not to get cross with me? I, I used to think when we talked about these issues, and we started talking about these issues a few years ago, I used to think it was shocking that grown-ups had to put their hands up working in call centres to ask for permission to go to the toilet. I used to think that was shocking. Now you've got people so frightened of being docked money for being off sick that they're giving birth in toilets in Mike Ashley's company. So, I, 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 I'm sorry because obviously I was getting cross about the tip of the iceberg and completely unaware of the fact that there was an enormous mass of ice lurking just beneath the surface. Think about that. I, I thought, and I know you did too because you told me, we thought it was shocking 
when we heard stories, we had callers telling us that they worked in call centres. It's going back a while. I think maybe the topic was probably the, the exportation of the jobs in call centres to, to India and other Asian countries. I can't remember what the original peg was. But I remember you telling me that you had to put your hand up to ask for permission to go to the lavatory. And I thought this was some sort of uh, almost Dickensian injustice that was being inflicted upon you. Now, now, I look back fondly on the days when we were shocked by tales of adults having to put their hands up to go to the toilet to visit the lavatory. I look back fondly on the days when we thought that was evidence of an exploitative employer. Because, well, the Sports Direct story really does merit comparison with a Victorian workhouse, which is precisely why this select committee has described it as akin to working in a Victorian workhouse. We don't need to focus on them. We can't focus on them. You can talk about them if you want. But I want to talk about you, or I want you to talk about you. I, I remember 25 years ago when I worked in a retailer on the high street in Worcester River Island, retailer there, and, and I remember when the manager, I was up a ladder and doing some, you know, stock taking or whatever it might be, and there must have been a little band of my undercrackers hoved into view above my trousers. And my undercrackers were from River Island. They were a recognisable paisley pattern. And I hadn't bought them. My mum had actually bought them for me before I even started working there. And the manager asked me to prove that I hadn't stolen them. And I, and I remember thinking at the time, and this was only a holiday job, you know, this wasn't, or, or a sort of gap job, this wasn't uh, at the end of the world if I, if I didn't work there anymore. I could still go home to mum and dad's, get fed and have a kip. I wasn't, I wasn't re relying on it for my livelihood. It was for beer money, to be honest with you. But I remember thinking at the time that he shouldn't really be able to do that. Even if he was suspicious of me stealing, he wasn't particularly suspicious of me. He just loved exercising his power. We've all had employers like that, haven't we? We've all had bosses who just do it for the sake of it. Why did you do that? Because I can. And I remember thinking at the time, that's blooming outrageous. That's absolutely outrageous. And it was the beginning of a sort of weird campaign. I don't want you to call me about obnoxious bosses. I, I want you to, I'm just doing my best to come up with something relevant to this conversation. I, I, I felt, and this is before they started eroding the rights that we currently have, I felt really impotent, really, really powerless. And then the trains kept getting delayed that summer. And, and he started telling me that if I was late for work, I had to bring a letter from the station master. I had to go and wait outside the station master's office to get a letter proving that the train really was late because the presumption was that I was a liar. And these, these stories that we heard on Monday about the Hermes workers having to arrange their own holiday cover, if they don't get someone to cover their round when they're away, and when they're away they don't get paid, they lose the round. I guess that's why we don't hear more about it, actually. So that's one question at 11 minutes after 10 this morning. We can cross off the list of questions I was about to ask. Why don't we hear more about it? Because people are frightened to tell us. Don't be frightened today. 03456060973 is the number that you need. Don't be frightened today. You can't obviously libel employers, um, but you can broadly describe where and who you work for. And just tell me, just tell me how powerless you feel. I suppose that's a bit skewed, isn't it? Because you might not feel remotely powerless, in which case you'll feel a little bit excluded from this conversation. But I'm not powerless at work. I, I'm far from it. I, and I, I want to hear your stories. I guess that's what they call... Is that what they call empathy? I don't know. I don't know. You tell me, OK, whether or not Sports Direct is freakish, a one-off, an exception, out of the ordinary. Most people working in warehouses or in shops, in retail or in storage, will be much, much better look af looked after than these people. I am not going to lie to you. I never do. But on this occasion, I don't, I, 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 my mind is not made up, but my suspicions are strong that this is not, by any stretch of the imagination, exceptional. It is quite possibly quite ordinary. But I need you to tell me, whatever you do, wherever you go, I didn't mean it, sorry. Whatever you do, wherever you go, I want, I want the simple question answered of powerlessness in the workplace and how much you suffer from that phenomenon. 12 minutes after 10, my phone, which is on silent, just started delivering a Donald Trump speech. Did, did you pick up on that at all? That, that was quite weird. And now I feel scared. Now I think the CIA are onto us. So we'll start with the workers, then we'll move on to America and see whether we can get to the end of the programme without CIA intervening in the programme. You can email james at lbc.co.uk and you can text me on 84850. The reason they tell us that these erosions of workplace rights are healthy. The reasons they tell us, and these are the same people that say you're not allowed to have an opinion about anything unless you've run a business. 
It's quite bizarre, that. The reason is that the more rights you have at work, the less likely you are to start a business. I'm not going to start a, a sports chain that covers the entire country if I have to pay people a decent wage and tell them on a Monday how much hours they're going to work between now and Friday. And that's what you keep getting. Andrea Leadsom was, was sort of busted for it before she pulled out of the Tory leadership campaign, saying small businesses shouldn't have to deal with maternity leave or, or parental leave and various other rights. And, and, and I don't buy that, actually. I really don't. That seems to me to be offering employers a carte blanche to treat their workers with absolute contempt on the grounds that if you're not allowed to treat your workers with absolute contempt, you won't be able to turn a profit. Well, then you shouldn't really be in business. It's 13 minutes after 10. The phone lines are open. Let's start with stories, OK? 0345 973 The picture painted of life at Sports Direct is staggering in its in its bleakness, and indeed, yes, I would use the word brutality. It's truly staggering. But I, I recognise that I live in a bit of a bubble on these sort of issues. I, I don't work in these sort of environments anymore. When I did, they weren't like this. I worked in shops until I was 25. There, there was nothing comparable to what I'm reading about Sports Direct. I wasn't aware that when I get my latest PlayStation game delivered to my door, it might have been delivered by somebody who is enduring the sort of practices that we heard about on Monday. Somebody who is uh, enjoying no sickness pay, no holiday pay, no protection in the workplace. I'm worried about some of the insurance issues that you've been emailing me about. I didn't know. I didn't know. And I do this for a living. I open up my phone lines every day and talk to you about real life. And I didn't know that this was there. This was going on. This was so widespread. What's going on in your place of work? Talk to me about powerlessness. 0345 6060 973 and tell me whether the Sports Direct story strikes you as the tip of the iceberg rather than the entire narrative. And the best way to do that, do you feel like you work in a Victorian workhouse? Sometimes. 03456060973. It's 10.15. I just want you to tell me whether or not the description of Sports Direct as being like a Victorian workhouse could also be applied to where you work or somewhere you have worked. 03456060973 is the number that you need. Steve's in Mitch. And Steve, what have you got? Hello, James. Thanks for having us on. I was thinking with stuff like this, it's down to the death of the trade unions. All of the uh, factories and workplaces would have had union reps years ago, but the press and the government, successive governments, have done such a hatchet job on trade unions that people are sort of scared or... But how, how have they been able to do a hatchet job on trade? Because what you would think, you're not the only person to say this. Perry picks up the point in this email, Steve. He writes, James, people don't care because they believe everything the best-selling papers in the country tell them, and that is that unions are bad, workers are lazy, you shouldn't rock the boat or your boss will leave the country. But people can look at the reality of their own existence. So, can I ask how old you are? Do you mind? Well, 55. So, so you, I mean, if, you, if you go back 30 years to, to, to when you were in work, you, you, you're telling me that because trade unions had a bit more teeth back then, you were much, much better looked after. Why don't other people see it that way? Why are so many people still persuaded that unions are a force for bad and that perhaps it's, I don't know, it's not their boss's fault that their boss treats them very badly? If you tell people that you're a trade unionist, if you tell people that, they think you're automatically some kind of maniac Marxist or Trotskyist who wants to bring down the country. They don't get the idea that you're just a normal person trying to help the people they work with. It's a, you know, it's trying to explain about swearing, to be truthful with well, you. Do your best, please. It's only 20 past yeah. 10. Uh, is people acting against, being encouraged to act against their own interests again, is it? Yeah, you, you frowned upon. I've, I've worked at loads of places where I said, yeah, this kind of stuff wouldn't happen if you just had someone to go to. It's just ba basic bread and butter issues in the workplace. It's not the downfall of the country. T to tell people you're a trade unionist now, people automatically will think you're sort of, you want to sort of destroy everything. But the thing is, most people, would, they don't have anyone to turn to. They don't have anyone to go to. They don't have a union rep in the workplace. They don't have someone who understands their rights and what they can do and what they can't do. They've got no one like that. And they're frightened um, of not having a job, so they suck it up and, and do whatever they're told. And, and people are suggesting... Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. And I, I, feel so, I feel dreadfully sorry for people who go to work like that. That must be absolutely awful for them. And they're not getting cross with the people who are doing it to them. They're not getting cross, it would seem, 
in the way that we get cross about other issues, they're not getting cross about exploitation, even though they're victims of it. And, and I hope it doesn't sound insulated or, or, or aloof to say, uh, on the outside looking into that, I, I don't get it. I can imagine being like it. I can do the empathy thing and think, well, crikey, if I lose my job, I don't know if I'll pay my bills at the end of this week, so if the boss wants me to do that, I'm going to have to bloody do it. And the Sports Direct story includes some claims of, of people being offered work in return for sexual favours. I mean, it's unbelievable that this is going on, but there's there's no traffic towards the top. It's almost as if the, the responsibility for this behaviour is, is dissipating. Nobody's being... Nobody's being held to account for it. Heartbreaking, absolutely. Well, I think it is, and, and yet you and I obviously see things similarly. There'll be plenty of people who don't. I think Johnny is one of them. He says, you often comment on stories about benefits cheats, James, that they're only in the news because they are so rare. The vast majority of employers in Britain do not treat their employers with contempt. They're good, honest, decent people who care about their employees. I absolutely um, applaud your reminder, and of course most people will probably recognise that, but we're not talking about a few little sort of outliers here. We're talking about some of the biggest brands in the land. The supermarkets, the warehousing there, I'm being told, is, is, stands comparison with this. There's a story from um, just from last year about Asos, the internet shopping giant, where its warehouse staff uh, are so frightened of being accused of, of not working hard enough that they use the water fountains instead of the urinals and the lavatory. Well, I presume that's just the men. Oh, goodness me, I hope it's just the men. They're using the water fountains in the, in the uh, warehouse instead of the lavatories because they're nearer. And these are massive, massive companies, and we keep hearing more about it. There was a uh, research into Amazon as well. Two questions. What's happened to you? I I is your workplace a bit like a Victorian workhouse? But also, why? Why, why? why do you think there's not... Why can't we marshal outrage about this in the way that Donald Trump at the moment is marshalling outrage about, I don't know, Mexicans and Muslims? He's, all these Americans that he's talking to, these so-called dispossessed, left-behind, forgotten people, they've been forgotten by their bosses. They haven't been forgotten by Mexicans. Their, their, their plight is not the responsibility of Muslims. So why is it so hard to whip up righteous fury at the right people? Liam's in Raynham. Liam, what would you like to say? Hello. Yeah, I used to work for a, a large... Um supermarket chain in their warehouse yeah and i can tell you that it's nowhere near, um just singular to um sports direct i mean all these places do these things in their warehouses like we used to get um in real trouble if we was to use a toilet say i was busting to the toilet mm. need to go to the toilet they would because we're timed everything we do we're timed how, how do you mean timed, Liam? Sorry to be so ignorant. So, so, so basically, when we you're out in a warehouse, you're picking certain items, and you're timed with a device because every time you pick an item, you have to sign it off. Okay. So they. So they you're doing the shopping for you're 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 going around the warehouse getting all the gum for my grocery delivery, right? No, 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 no. So basically, if a, a shop say in London needs twenty packets of coke 20 whatever it is yes we pick that for the shops and that gets sent to the okay shop. okay yes and um, so what they would what, the, what they would do if if for some reason you was inactive for three minutes you'd be called into the office where was you for this three minutes and you had to justify it well i'd go to the toilet or and the how, how, how often would, would that happen every time there was a three minute gap on your schedule Oh, yeah, definitely. So, it, see, it, I need it, to it, slow it, you down a bit, because this is something that's so familiar to you. You're talking as if it's quite casual, and, and, <laughs> and, and yet it's going to be shocking to a lot of people listening. So, you're a grown man, working in a warehouse, yeah. uh, working hard. You, you, you have to pop to the loo, or you, I, I don't know, have to sort of uh, rearrange yourself. You need a minute here and a minute there. But anything over three minutes, you'll be called into the office. You'd be called in. Um, it'd be, you'd, you'd basically have to justify just doing what your body does if that makes sense. So you, as a grown-up, have to go into a room and tell a member of management that you needed a wee-wee or a yeah, and number two. And, and the amount of people that um, they, will, they, will, they will pick an item and then halfway to get into the toilet, then they'll confirm that they've picked that item just so it, it slows that time down, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And, and then they quickly go to the toilet and run back. And it's, it's a sad... And there's some guys in there, they're like in their 50s and 60s working there. And it's sad to see, like, older guys like that having to live their lives like that. And especially the older you get, the, the less control, I suppose, you have over those things. And, uh... Yeah, so it's sad to see. Over your bladder, I hadn't thought of it like <laughs> that. Um, yeah. you, you tell the story, you chuckle. Um, yeah. 
why? why how, I don't know what question I want to ask. I, I kind of want to ask, how do they get away with it? But that makes me sound like a trot. Well, well it, you know, it's, I, I don't know. Uh, the manager seemed to, in, uh, uh, without saying horrible, the manager seemed to enjoy the power that they've been given from whoever. They always do. Like, yeah, I mean, like, the warehouse as well. It's, it's like, in these sort of days, like where we've had the hottest days of the year, past couple of weeks, um, it, it's hot and there's such little ventilation in there. People need a drink of water. We're not allowed to carry water with us. That's, that's just a given in the warehouse. We're not allowed to carry water with us. So we have to go... Why not? The what, what's the reasoning, reasoning behind that? Because they stock a lot of water, we'd have to prove where we'd got the water from. So just, just in case you, you've stolen 20 pence worth of water? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, so you're treated... Yeah. The reason you can't have water on a hot day at work is because they're presuming you're a thief. Basically, yeah. I mean, there was one guy once, it sounds silly, he was caught with a chocolate bar in his pocket and he was given a disciplinary because he couldn't prove that he hadn't taken it from the warehouse. You know, I wondered whether my underpants story would sound a bit out of place during this hour, but it's the same sort of thing, isn't it? It's, it's a curious cult of management where people really enjoy exercising power over you, but, but, but this was in an era when I was young that it was extraordinary. And when I told my mates about it, they were all shocked. You tell your mates about what went on in this supermarket warehouse and they've all got similar stories, presumably? Well... Well, this is it. Well, I was an employee of this supermarket, like I was employed on the cards, etc. You yeah. have the guys who work for the agency, and they r really get it bad. They, they're, they're, they're treated terribly, because they know, they're, a lot of them are foreign workers, they know yes. that if they don't put in the work, that's it, they're not contracted, see you later. So, them guys really struggle. I mean, we think we have it hard, they have it terribly hard really really bad and, and i suppose part of the answer to the question of why you guys don't kick up more of a fuss is that you're frightened of ending up like those guys who have even fewer protections in the workplace than you do i i that was liam i'm so grateful to you my phone lines are full which is kind of par for the course these days but i i, I want to remind you as soon as i bid farewell to liam it frees one up for you i hope this is reaching your ears in the way that it's reaching mine as as quite an important conversation about something that perhaps we don't think about or talk about enough now i cannot i have failed already i will not be able to make you if you're sitting at home thinking oh yeah you, you know i'd get deal with it this is the real world get on with it or you're sitting at home thinking oh, it can't be as bad as i'm hearing I, I will never be able to whip you up into righteous fury about the way your fellow citizens are being treated in the way that i could with my eyes shut and both hands tied behind my back whip you up into righteous fury about some polish people you you've never met, who, uh, who, are, who are moving into a, a house on the other side of town. I could do that. I know I could. It's easy. I mean, you can see how easy it is by how successful thick people are at doing it. Why? Why do you think that is? I, I, I'm bringing immigration into it. Because as, as the last caller reminded us, a lot of the foreign workers here will be treated even worse than the domestic workers because they'll be even less au fait with employment rights, even less likely to be protected by a union. How, how, how is it possible to hear from British workers being treated like absolute scum and feel very little anger growing among the British public. Whereas, if you just pick the usual targets, you'd be able to get yourself elected practically on the tidal wave of fury that you've whipped up, often based on nothing or very little that resembles reality. I want the whys, not just the whats. It's half past ten. Where the question is pretty simple. Um, why aren't we sticking up for workers in Britain who are being treated appallingly by their bosses? And on the rare occasions that we do recognise that workers are being treated badly, we divide them in order to rule them. We don't combine to go after the people treating them badly. We blame immigration or immigrants for the fact that British workers, British-born workers, are suffering at work. Think about that for a minute. It's actually incredible. You couldn't have written it better, could you? Yourself, if you were seeking to create an utterly craven, cowed workforce, too frightened of their own shadow to ever stand up to an employer. All right, I'm going a bit Dickensian myself now. But the House of Commons Select Committee has described Sports Direct as being like a Victorian workhouse. So all those little breaks in your brain when you sometimes think maybe you're going a bit over the top, I think they've just been taken off those breaks. 10.34 is the time. More of your stories on 0345 6060973. But also, also the why. It's not just about trade unions. If, especially if we bring immigration into it, which has been so successfully stoked up in so many people's minds as the reason why their life hasn't gone as well as they were hoping. Both in America and, and in Britain and elsewhere, France, everywhere. Why, why is your life not going that well? Oh, immigration. Whereas, in fact, people are sitting in boardrooms passing judgment upon your working conditions. People are sitting in boardrooms deciding how little to pay you. People are sitting in boardrooms actively 
actively and quite deliberately writing up rules and regulations that mean you're frightened to go to the lavatory or you're timed. You're timed when you have a comfort break. They're, they're sitting there writing these rules and you're getting cross about the Polish bloke next to you who's just as frightened and exploited as you are. It's nuts. Vicky's in St. Albans. Vicky, what can you tell us? Oh, hi there. Thank Hello, you for Vicky. taking my call. I'm really nervous, so please bear with it's, me. It's only me, Vicky. There's nothing to be nervous about. <laughs> uh, my daughter worked for Sports Direct a couple of years ago. Um, she was still at school, bless her, um, and she needed some extra money, so she got herself a little job. Um, one particular um, day, her, she, she has a very severe nut allergy. Oh, dear. Um, and they knew about this because obviously you have forms to fill in when you apply for these jobs and, and she made it quite aware that of she course. had a pen with her and she needed it if, you know, things got bad. Um, but her manager one day decided to place a peanut M&M in her hand and thought it was absolutely hilarious. Oh, what a prank. Um, this is, Lauren, j j j just to clarify, and, and yeah. I'll give you all the time that you want, but I have to remind... Yeah you as well, the Sports Direct aren't here to respond to this. And, no, and, and, I understand and that. What, what you're describing, to my ears at this point, is one obnoxious prat, rather than necessarily evidence of broader working yeah. practices. Yeah, it gets worse, so. Hmm. Um, she questioned it and said, this is a peanut one, isn't it, as her eyes started to itch, and she could feel herself becoming quite panicky. Um, and he just said yes and laughed. And so she said, I I'm feeling really ill. And instead of actually helping her, he made her go and stand in the car park and call for her own ambulance. It was quite distressing, as you can imagine. Yeah, of course I can imagine. I can, I can hear um, the distress in your voice. What, what, so, she, <laughs> so the ambulance came? Um, she got taken into hospital and spent three days in hospital. Well, did you go to the authorities and about this? We actually um, contacted Sports Direct. We went as high as we possibly could, but they are so well protected, these guys, <laughs> that you get nowhere, absolutely nowhere. They did come and do a store inspection and have put signs up saying no food allowed. That's how they reacted you know. to this? Yeah, <laughs> but that was it, basically. Did but she, she go she back to work back. after? No, no, I was going to no, say. No, my that. husband just said, that's it, that's, that's it now. We, we, we got nowhere and we basically... You know, well, thank God she's all. Thank God she's all right. Exactly. Yeah. But this is the very definition of the sort of powerlessness that we were yeah. addressing. And any any sort of thoughts and, and and I stress again, they're not here to defend themselves. But any thoughts and fears that this select committee report might have exaggerated are, are, are thrown into pretty stark relief by what you're you're telling us. And and as a young woman from obviously a yeah. secure background, a loving family, yeah, she hasn't got a. A, a, a prayer, really, when she finds herself coming up against the massed ranks of, of a company like this. No, exactly. What I'm about the police? I, I, I'd have been tempted to go to the police about that. I know, I know. I, I mean, it was just all panic mode, as, as you can imagine, thing, really. It? You know, those sort of things go out the window. You just, you know, you're just there at the hospital and just praying that everything's okay. Yes. Um, you know, we just needed to get her out. I mean, the sad thing about it all was that she did actually have a foreign manager and and it was obviously like the tables have turned, you know. She's a white British girl working for a foreign manager and that's how he treated her. Yes. You know, it's very sad. It, well, it is very sad. I, I mean, I, the, 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 the ethnicity or the nationality of the manager is not as relevant as the obnoxiousness and the unacceptability no, of his no, conduct. Absolutely. But, but I, I can understand why you mention it, given the parallels I was drawing a moment ago. Vicky, I want to find out more about this story. I, 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 I mean, it's probably too late to help or do anything like that, but my God. My God, you, you ask for tales of powerlessness. You don't expect to hear anything quite like that. Albert's in Highgate. Albert, what do you want to say? Hello. Hello, Albert. What's on your mind? Hello, James. How um, you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, I'm grand. What, what, what do you want to say? Yeah, I'm actually in Romford. Um, yeah. I work in the Romford branch in uh, Sports Direct. And, you know, it's just like Vicky and the phone before Liam said, you just get spoken to like an absolute bit of dirt, bottom line. They speak to you like absolute scum. Um, you know, I, for instance, I drink plenty of water a day. Yeah. I drink like four or five litres of water a day, James. Wow. And you know, uh, th yeah, this is the thing. Like, I need to go to the toilet. Oh, it's quite a lot of water. To this is to keep your complexion yeah. fresh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. tell. Yeah. Well, I'm on the training turn out in a minute, James. Fair enough. Yeah, so, you know, they just, when you ask them to go for a toilet five, six times a day, they 
they let you go, obviously, but like Liam said, you've only got a three-minute limit in there, and you've got to look over your shoulder, and it's an absolute joke. You know, and then you ask for a holiday, and it's just it's just a joke, James. I can tell, and, and I've got to tell you, the calls are queuing up. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that's a bit stupid, mate, all right? But I'm not being stupid. I just need to open this up, and I need your help in doing it. Why do you put up with it? Because it pays my rent. You know? It pays my bills. I've got a small child on the way. I can't afford to quit my job and go back on to the jam roll. The jam roll. No. I, well, and that's the point, isn't it? So it, it, it's work. It's income, and, and you rely upon it, but you're getting nothing in return except money. You're not getting respect. You're not getting protection. You're not getting some of the most basic basic rights that you'd expect in the workplace. I, and, and, and again, I'd ask the question, why, why are we... It's just because we don't know, right? You're hearing these stories... And if you're built in a certain way politically, you're already looking for reasons to excuse it or disbelieve it. And if you're built in another way politically, you're perhaps too daunted by the size of the task to even begin the journey. Peter is in Billericay. Peter, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Hello, mate. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I was uh, walking in Sainsbury's uh, the other day. I've had a fairly long period of ill health. And I wanted to get back into work. And I saw a lady, um, one of the members of staff, walking down one of the aisles with a crutch. And I stopped her and I said, look, I've been trying to get back through to work from a for ages. I take 11 tablets a day for various illnesses. I said, but I've been really finding it hard to find an employer who I think will be sympathetic to my illness and take me on. And she said, oh, this company's brilliant. They, they really look after me. I said, if I'm off sick, they, they, they don't mind. And, and, they're, and they're, they've always looked after me. And so I got an interview with this major national supermarket and I've just got a job. Uh, it's my first job in a few years, and as you can as you can imagine, I'm nearly I'm 48 now, and it's harder when you get older to find work. And I'm actually over the moon that I found a company that I could actually say to in my interview, I'm not well, and they said, fine, you're still best qualified for the job, blah de blah de blah, and uh, I'm going to be starting in a couple of weeks, so I'm over the moon. Good. Now, congratulations as well. Thank you very much indeed, James. I, I'm over the moon by it. Now, I first started working in retail in the mid-80s where there was no point of sale. So basically when you wanted to ring something into a till, you had to do 12 99 enter and that was your sale. Yeah. Then they introduced EPOS, so it was all done on barcodes. And now since we've had all these computers and barcodes and everything, everything can be tracked literally to the second to the minute every yes. sales transaction, every profit on every sale is tracked. And not just sales, because if you're in the warehouse, the barcodes are used to, to as we've heard, to, to, to clock how much, how quickly you're moving as you clock up the, uh, the collection. It's, and it's changed so much. Back then, after work, we used to go down the pub and have a drink, and we were all like a family. And I'm quite old school when it comes to the mentality of looking after my people. I was a manager for over 20 years, and I've got this old thing that's going on in my head. Perhaps I'm wrong, but if you look after your people, they'll look after you. And I used to be more of a dad to a lot of the staff than, than, than actually an employer. But that has been missing and it's been fading over the years. But the point I wanted to make was the pressure that's been put on middle management in order to hit their targets is immense. And some of the stories, the one about that nut allergy, made me cringe. Yes. I mean, you could, you could come to me if you needed a day off, or if you wanted to change a day, if you needed to do this, you have to go to the hospital, my, my daughter's not well. I'd bend over back to try and change shifts in order to try and help you. But these days... You're a man out of time, aren't you? Because I, I started I in retail in the mid-80s as well, the late 80s, actually. But, and, yeah. and, and you're right, you'd encounter the odd idiot, both on, on, on your level and yeah. above you. But generally speaking, you, you did your best work for the bosses you liked. The commission was yeah. the material benefit, and, and, and respect yeah. and decency was the immaterial benefit. But, you know, there's, there's nothing better for team spirit on a Sunday afternoon because that's the only time you can do it now because 11 to 5 or 10 to 4 on a Sunday, you can actually go out. We used to go bowling in my last company. I used to work for a major photographic retailer that went bust and now it's reopened under a different, under yes. the same name, but a different owner. And uh, we used to have this great tea. And, and, and hearing these stories makes me really mad. I can tell. It so does me as well. But why, 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 why is that madness so, so impotent? Why is there not, why, why is there not, any sort of movement here. I, I mean, it, it explains well, partly the appeal of Jeremy Corbyn because although he hasn't got any answers, he at least seems to be asking these sort of questions. What you want from politicians, of course, is answers, not just questions. So, so why? Well, I, I, I guess big, I guess the last yeah. caller nailed it, didn't he? He's just got bills to pay. He hasn't got time to I mean, mount a revolution. Yeah. <laughs> and that's oppression. So when this job came along, can I mention the name of the supermarket? You already have, mate. Uh, did I say it? I'm so yeah. sorry. That's all right. Uh, this, um, but, uh, um, but no, I, I, mean, I, I have to say, 
imagine I, I was working for 25 years and I got ill and I got all kinds of stuff going on and then and and this, this no, well, I, 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 I hear you and I wish you well and I'm sorry in a way that we're raining on your parade a little bit although I, I would hope that Sainsbury's will be um, immune. I've got a very good friend who, 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 who works at Sainsbury's. He has learning difficulties and is, is, is much older than me and he, he gets very well looked after by them as well. So hopefully, you know, as, as we should recognise for every bad company that we discuss, hopefully there are 200 good ones. But at the moment, I have to tell you, Peter looks like the exception to the rule rather than the rule that needs an exception. 10.46 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I want to take all your calls on this. I'll get through as many as I can before 11 o'clock. After 11 o'clock, the plan is to turn our attention to Donald Trump. Now, there are three ways you can do this. You can text me on 84850, you can tweet at Mr. James OB, or you can email james at lbc.co.uk. I make absolutely no commitment whatsoever to following any of your advice or suggestions, but I might. So text, tweet, or, or email me. The question that you would do if you were presenting this show right now, the question you would ask about Donald Trump after 11 o'clock. Okay, I've got one. I'm not making you do the heavy lifting while cashing the checks. Honest. Although if you do need to go to the lavatory, you better ask my permission and I'll start the stopwatch. Get, send me the question you would ask about Donald Trump after 11 o'clock this morning if this, if this wasn't the uh, James O'Brien show, but it was your show. Well, it is your show, but obviously you're not presenting it's 10.46. We're not all taking this seriously. Um, <laughs> when was your lobotomy completed and are you pleased with the results? That's not a question that I'm going to put to Donald Trump. Anyway, I'm just looking for questions I'm going to ask you and you might answer. Has anyone placed a bet on Donald Trump becoming president and what odds did you get? That's quite interesting. Do you know, we never tracked down that guy. Do you remember the guy who rang in before the referendum? Who put, he put 200 grand on Remain while, while voting to leave. He stopped answering his phone. He must have known it was ours. Silly old sausage. Um, other questions that you have submitted include, I would ask him if France was one of those countries that he would ban immigration from, says Matthew in Worcester Park. I'd ask him if Britain was. He said he's going to ban immigration from any country that's been compromised by terrorism. But America has been compromised by terrorism. Great Britain has been compromised by terrorism. France has been compromised by terrorism. Spain has been compromised by terrorism. There's barely a country on the planet that hasn't been compromised by terrorism. So, well, I guess uh, the border guards in America are not going to be very busy under a Trump presidency. And it's the sort of suggestion that makes many, many people, in fact, look, let's just call a spade a spade. It's the sort of suggestion that makes people with brains in their head and eyes in the front of their face think the man starts staring mad. I mean, absolutely bonkers. And yet, he's in with a very good chance of becoming president of America. And it's quite baffling. It, truly, truly baffling. We'll try and unbaffle it after 11. Uh, but I still need your questions. I still need your suggestions on what, what question I should ask. Back to shops, exploitation, workplace, and uh, an underlying question of why, why we have allowed this to happen to us. You know, sometimes these memes that I inflict upon you um, seem a little trite and cliched, but sometimes they really do resonate, you know. And that old Malcolm X line about if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people being oppressed and loving the people oppressing you. It just begins to ring a little bit true when you look at these Victorian conditions, this workhouse type scenario that Sports Direct employees have to endure and many other employees of other companies are telling us they have similar experience of. And yet, as you've pointed out to me, when I said, uh, quite a lot of you have tweeted this, I said a minute ago, you know, oh, I was about to say something, and I stopped myself saying it's, oh, I sound like a trot. And Brendan suggests that that is how they have managed to achieve it, because you now have this idea in your head that if you stick up for workers, or you suggest that the, um, uh, that the balance is skewed, or that people are being treated unfairly, or that workers deserve more protection and more rights, as soon as you start saying anything like that, there's a little voice in your head going, oh, you're such a communist, you're such a trot, and maybe that does mean they have worked. Maybe that does mean that it's mission accomplished. Ray's in rice slip. Ray, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi. Um, I was a manager up until late last year when uh, I left the company. And it's not just retail, it's not just warehousing. I, I work for a large telecommunications outfit. Yeah. And I managed uh, teams of field engineers. Okay. Uh, now, as a manager, you get pressure from senior managers, uh, and it's all dressed up under sort of HR speak that, you know, you, you, you need to assess your people in terms of differentiation. Uh, which means you're going to have high performers and low performers. Even if you've got a high performing team, you're still expected to pick out and discipline or put through um, input improvement programs um, the lowest performers on a high performing team. 
which is kind of ridiculous. It's yeah. you know, it, it, it's it's well, it's well, 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 what's the, the reason the for it? Worst football. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. In your own words, what's the reason behind it? Because you know, I, I think the further up the line you get, the the more um, disconnected you get from people, the more connected you get to your balance sheet, and the more reliant or the more. Uh, I suppose important the shareholders and the dividends are, the more tyrannous that balance sheet becomes. You, 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 yeah, you, you care yeah, only about... Absolutely, and I don't think it's always a power trip. I think very often it's a case of you need to be seen to be doing something. And the managers and might be drive. just as stressed as the ordinary workers because they're getting it from above as well. Exactly. You, you're, you're, you're coaching an ethos of continuous improvement. Um, which basically ends up... I, I had one manager, the, um, one senior manager, who took me aside once and coached me. And, and one of the reasons why I thought early retirement seemed like a bloody good idea yes. was he took me to one side and, and he said, well, you, and I'll clean it up for you. He said, you do, of course, realise that poo rolls downhill, don't you? Hmm. And, and that was his pep talk. Yes, yeah, it's a sort of opposite of trickle down economics in a way, isn't it? But it, it's, <laughs> well, it's passing the buck, yeah, that sort of thing. Trickle down sticky stuff. Well, well, yeah, all right, mate. Steady on. People are having their elevenses. What about <laughs> uh, what, what? What about the question of 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 why we're so cowed? Actually, as a way, is it is as simply as saying that because I can't be the bloke who stands up in case I lose my job. I think that there's gem I think generally over the past ten, fifteen years we've we've come through that period of, of the, the sort of the Arthur Scargill type union uh, setup and, and we we've ended up with a situation where we don't trust people. No, we don't. Um so, so you have sort of um I mean in my experience you have uh, things like uh, trackers built into the vehicle yeah. not to stop someone stealing it, but so that you can see that they're taking the most direct route between one customer and the next. To which you say, if you got in, uh, you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. But actually, I do exactly. fear. I do fear being treated like a lab rat, like a human drone, which Absolutely. is what they want. Absolutely, which is why I'm now working for a very small organisation, which is very personable. I sit next to the guy who owns the company. We laugh, we banter all day, and we actually achieve a hell of a lot more. Are you not vulnerable, though, to take over from a massive company employing the kind of practices that you've described? Um, maybe in ten years, yeah. from which time... You'll be all right. I'll be, in a, I'll be in a rocker on a, on a porch somewhere. You'll be all right, Jack. Thank you, Ray. It's 10.57 is the time. Um, last word, probably, on this, glancing at the clock. Anne's in Enfield. Anne, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Um, I just called in. Um, my son's had various problems over the years with various jobs. Yes. Um, he was unemployed for quite a long time. You basically end up taking pretty much anything you can get. I understand. Um, he's, he's currently working at a firm where he hasn't been there very long, right. but he's being expected to do 12-hour days. He's, he's a driver, and he also has to do a lot of heavy lifting in his deliveries, way above the health and safety limit for one person to lift. Mm. Um, he's basically absolutely shattered it's not what he signed up for he thought he was joining a you know a, a nice reasonable company yes. long interview but on well with the boss etc um he's he's raised the issues with them he's tried to say you know this just isn't acceptable and they've said well you don't have to stay <laughs> and that's um, it that's the answer if, if you don't if like leaves, it there's the door well the big problem is if he leaves he's he was doing agency work prior to that and he thought this was a more a more secure way of, of moving on he's in his 40s yeah. so you know he's in a difficult position for finding other jobs um and basically if he leaves the next employer wants to know why did you only stay a month or three months yeah. or whatever it is at, at, at your last employment nobody asks employers you know to, to justify their turnover of employees but the if you leave a job like that especially if you're unlucky enough and you have more than one mm. um that where you don't stay very long you, you basically get seen as a troublemaker or there's a question mark well, you over block your the old copy book, don't you? and it's also hard to get it's, it's, it's hard to leave if you if you're on jsa or something like that there's a there's a there's a period of moratorium if that, that's the point. So you don't yeah. have the option to just leave and then say, well, you know, I'll, I've got a safety net of JSA for a couple of weeks until I find something else because you don't get it because you're, you're sanctioned, they call it, don't they? You're, you're, yes. you're sanctioned for whatever, you know, six weeks Leaving or more. a job voluntarily it can go up to 13, exactly. some people have told me. What are we going to do so about it, Anne? You can't nope. pay your rent and then you, yeah. you know, then you have trouble with your landlords. Um, and basically, the unions are broken, which is in my opinion, the 
they may they may well they're not entirely broken, but they're not what they used to be. Um, so you've got the so you've got nowhere to turn to. to deal no. with it. Go on. And and he has a friend who basically was in a management position at a at a large. I'm going to run out of time, man. Um, I've got the news coming yeah, up. You can okay. tell. Um, Tribunals don't help. No, they don't, and you have to pay your own way to get to them now. The, 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 the last government, the current government, made it harder, made it easier to be fired for no reason, and harder to take your employer to tribunal. And we barely noticed. Talk about boiling a frog.